Hello again. Now, the Center for Applied Legal Studies is joining forces with the Embrace Project and an individual rape survivor to challenge a definition of sexual offenses. The applicants want to change a section which fails to criminalize sexual violence where the suspect believed the victim consented. The organization says its application was unopposed. Let's discuss this matter further now with Dr. Ashina Swimmer. She's the head of gender justice at the center and research specialist in gender-based violence. That's Lisa Verten. Doc and Lisa, good afternoon. Welcome to today and thank you very much uh, for your time, ladies. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, first up, can I start with you, uh, doc, Dr. Swimmer? Uh, why has the center joined this matter? Uh, I mean, the, the, the Sexual Offenses Act was amended recently, but there is a case now. It's facing a challenge on one of its provisions. Why have you decided to join Embrace Project and the individual rape survivor who were the original ones to bring this case up in court? So thank you for having me. Uh, the Centre for Applied Legal Studies has decided to intervene as another applicant in this matter as we believe that the issue around uh, having the definition of sexual offences contain consent or continue to contain consent is the issue to a lot of uh, problems surrounding conviction and high uh, burdens of proof for the state. So we decided to enter to expand what was already being asked for by, um, by Embrace um, to the court and ask for a consent to be taken out of the definition of sexual offences. Okay, is that, is that the main issue here that uh, the Sexual Offences Act as amended uh, recently still contains uh, this thing, this provision around consent and you want it to be completely removed? Yes, so that's what Kells would argue. Um, many argue that it's sufficient uh, to, as the state argues, to include consent and have consent as part of the sexual offences. However, what we argue is that the problematic defence, which is the mistaken belief in consent defence, emerges when you retain consent as part of the, uh, the definition of the, of the crime. Yeah, this, guy, this, this issue was, I think, uh, Embrace Project and the, and the individual rape survivor, they took the case to court last year. There was another case, Lisa, where this consent issue mm. saw a person who was accused of having allegedly raped a partner uh, said to court, he thought because she kissed me, she consented to, to sex. Mm. And she said, I said no. And then there was outrage. And hence, we're here today, Lisa. Yes, that's right. That's the Coco matter, which um, was heard by Judge Mbukai Tobi and, of course, created the outcry. And that's also going to come before the courts in round about mid-November, the appeal against that decision. I mean, I think this question of consent has been a very thorny one around the world. And we've seen a range of different um, countries attempt to grapple with it in different ways. You know, whether they try to put in new standards around how you um, look at consent that you must have what we would call a communicative model of consent. You can't just think, oh, well, she smiled at me. She's holding my hand. She's allowing me to caress her leg. Therefore, that means I can have sex. The court, in, in a number of jurisdictions, they've said, you need to actually be much more explicit. And you need to actually check that somebody is consenting. So we've seen a range of these kinds of shifts in different countries around the world. And I think although the Sexual Offences Act was amended in 2007, these two cases start to try and push and take a bit further what was um, mm. what was initially what was initiated back in 2007. Yeah, this was the Eastern Cape uh, High Court that handed down the judgment when Louis Sotoko appealed an earlier guilty conviction in terms of raping uh, his then partner. So, so now the, the, the challenge here is we are in a country, Lisa, we talk to you now and again every year mm -hmm. around gender-based violence. Uh, c clarity around this matter or the removal of uh, mention of consent as in the provisions of this amended law would, would assist, I guess, in the fight against GBV. Is that what you believe, Dr. Swimmer? Well, it will definitely assist with regards to convictions in, in some instances, so long as we have courts that don't rely on rape stereotypes and discriminatory views of women. 
it will go a long way to assisting in prosecutions. However, will it decrease the rates of rape in our country? It's not likely because the changing laws aren't a simple fix. And that's often what people think is if you, you amend a bunch of laws, things are going to be different. But that really is about uh, the, our communities that we live in, the view of women and, and gender diverse people, as well as things like police investigation. So what we rather frame it as is trying to clear out these pathways to justice in terms of the law, but it is really limited to that only. Yeah, Lisa, what's, what is your view about why it's important that this matter is in court particularly? Because I think it would have some implications for sexual offences prosecutions. It certainly would. I mean, one of the things that we, one of the clear indications we have of how difficult the courts find to prosecute rape is that the Department of Justice and the NPA set targets for the courts around the conviction, the number of convictions that they should um, achieve for each crime. And rape of all our crimes is set the lowest conviction rate. So that already tells you that the courts see that there's a very clear difficulty here. And these difficulties are numerous. I think when you go to court in a rape matter, you are stepping into hundreds of years of discriminatory attitudes towards rape complainants that have insisted that they lie, that they imagine things, that they're fantasists, that they're malicious, that they're drunk, and make up stories about men, that they're pregnant and they want to look for a father for the child. So there's this very significant weight of discrimination that burdens you the minute you step into a box. And this has had to be chipped away and has been chipped away over decades. This is, I think, another step forward. But as Shinya is saying, it's not necessarily going to be a magical fix because I think there are still particular groups of women who suffer particularly in the courts. The, the, those are the groups who have intellectual disabilities. In fact, their cases don't even make it to court. So the question of conviction is out of the question because they're simply not seen as credible. And that's a group we have simply not, I think, paid sufficient attention to and made the kinds of necessary changes we need to in order to give full recognition to their rights to protection, dignity and safety. I think the other group we also have to grapple with, and I've just seen from my research, the other group of women who also don't get through the door are women who have been drinking at the time um, that the rape occurred there is a complete disbelief in them. So their cases don't even make it through. And I think these cases which are more difficult often don't even get placed on the court rolls. They don't even get considered by the courts. So we also have to change, I think, the way the courts see these cases and persuade them to take a chance on doing these more difficult cases if we want to change the law. And the ripple effect will be that if we see convictions starting to happen in these cases, it will start to dawn on some men that actually they can't behave like this. It is actually criminal. It's not acceptable okay. and it's not something they're going to get away with. So is the criminalization of any form of sexual violence or coercion what you seek to achieve, Dr. Soma, by joining Embrace Project in terms of this particular sections of this law? Yes, entirely. We're not... We're not suggesting something, and I know I know the state has has alluded to this, and and other individuals that we are creating a place where the accused person now has to disprove their guilt. We're still saying yes, the state has an obligation to prove the guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But what we're saying is, in other crimes such as theft, you can raise a defence of consent, but that that definition of consent is not contained in the 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 outline or the definition of theft so why don't we make the playing grounds equal when it comes to sexual offenses and other crimes where we have women being disproportionately affected we have these high thresholds but we don't have them in crimes that may not see women as the disproportionate victims yeah so what what would be the next thing steps now in the in this matter you've joined i, I think uh, you've recently was it yesterday that you joined as a, uh, the Embrace Project in this matter, plus the other uh, individual uh, rape survivor. What's the next step in this legal process? Just, just to unpack it for us for a minute. So in this legal process, what we're busy with at the moment, I actually just received the state's, um, state's affidavit opposing us. And, and I think we should, we should pause there to say, why would a, a democratic state oppose something like this when we have such high rates of gender-based violence in our country? But what we have to do is then reply to the affidavit and then start with our heads of arguments. And then we should be in court early next year. 
but Coles will also be representing Isla in two weeks, as Lisa has said. Okay, and that's happening in, in, in November. That's a separate matter. That's the appeal in two weeks' time in November, Lisa, linked to the, the issue, the Coco issue in the Eastern Cape. Am, am I correct? That's right. Is that the appeal? That is correct, yes. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so, so, so Lisa, uh, I mean, we've said, and, 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 and Sheena as well, that this will not stop if anything changes, but it's a step mm -hmm. in the right direction to, to assist. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I am thinking, yes, we can change the laws, as Sheena said, but uh, behavior will not change immediately. But we've got the laws to make sure that perpetrators then can face the, can, 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 can face the music and, and there's justice for the, for the survivors. But this process has made me ask, this legal process, are our laws advocate at all in dealing with GBV, Lisa? You know, I think people often look to the law in the hope that the law is going to change things. But I think one of the things we have to accept is that the law is not a, it's not a silver bullet. It's a very blunt instrument. It will fix some things. There are many things that cannot, well, and, and it, it cannot fix and will not make much of a difference too. So I think the challenge to us is, to look at law and to use law when it's appropriate, but to also become far more imaginative and much more expansive in our thinking around how we address the problem of gender-based violence. The reality is, I think, is that many women, men, children, gender diverse individuals don't necessarily want to use the law and have good reason not to do the, to use the law. So what other options can we offer yeah. them to ensure that they still get justice? So I think Let's focus on the law, it's important, but it's not the only thing, because it will never be something you can use in every instance. Um, so I think that's, that's our challenge as well, is to think about the law and many other things too. Yeah, but this effort, this effort by Embrace Project, Center for Applied Legal Studies and the Individual Rape Survivor, are to be welcomed, I guess, uh, in chipping away at some possible uh, uh, stumbling blocks in, in the law, uh, Sheena? Are you there, Dr. Swemer? I think we might have lost uh, Dr. Swemer there. Yeah, Lisa? If I, if I come in, yes, it, it would be very important. And I think one of the things about law is that it starts conversations. So, you know, the, the, these kinds of cases do get people thinking, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this going too far? How do, if, this, if, it, if we accept that this is a problem, then what does it mean for how we change our behavior? And so I think that's the other aspect of law which we perhaps don't always give enough credit to, is the way it can get, encourage people to start thinking about, well, how do we behave differently? How do we create different sexual norms? Because I think there's still many who think, mm. if I go to a woman and I buy her a drink, and she accepts my drink, and I buy her another two drinks, that means she's consented to go home with me and have sex with me. And if she doesn't, well then, she has led me on and I'm entitled to take sex from her violently. I'm giving you a very simplified example, yes, but that's yes. the kind of thinking that we need to challenge. And these kinds of cases can help start those conversations where somebody might have to think, actually, I can't do that anymore. I'm going to yes. have to think of a different way to relate um, to whoever I want to go out with and build a relationship with them with the hope of having yeah. sex. Yeah, f finally, Lisa, just for you, I just want to get a sense from you. Uh, Sheena made a point just a short while ago that she's just received, the, the Center for Applied Legal Studies, uh, CALS, have just received the affidavit from the government, from the state prosecutor, that they're fighting this matter that we're talking about. She was saying she wonders what kind of a democratic government would do so. Part of that norm that you're talking about, the example you've used, should also begin there, how our governors, how our government, how governance is made in mm. terms of how justice is meted out. Surely something like this, sh we should be welcomed by everybody to say, no, this will close another door of possible uh, 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 rape activity. You would hope so, but I think, you know, having seen some of the, some of the, the state papers in the earlier parts of this um, matter, they have concerns around what will this do around questions of intentionality, for example, um, and questions of the burden of proof, and also I think questions of the, as Sheen was mentioning, the does the accused start from a position okay. where he has to disprove his guilt, which would be contrary to the entire basis of the criminal law. So if the state firmly believes that, then yes, they should go to court and go and, and, and have their arguments settled. So you would like them to do this, but if those are their concerns, then take it to court and have a judge settle okay. this area of law for, for yeah. them so that the questions are put to one side.
We'll have to find out early next year what Sheena said earlier about this matter when it comes before court. Thank you very much, Lisa Fetton and uh, Sheena Swemmer from the Center for Applied Legal Studies. And, uh, of course, Lisa Fetton is a GBV research uh, specialist.